After the 18-year-old daughter of a family was involved in a horrific accident, the family went on to face endless harassment as a result. Harassment that will absolutely ruin what little faith in humanity you may have left. Many people out there will tell you that a picture you upload online will never truly go away. That's all well and good if you upload the picture yourself, but what if someone else uploads the picture against your will, without your permission, and while you're already grieving the loss of a daughter? The subject of our video today was a young woman named Nikki Castoris. Nikki was the daughter of a novelist named Leslie Castoris and a wealthy real estate broker named Christos Castoris. She was 18 years old, had just barely started taking classes at a college a couple of months prior, and lived in a swanky home out in Orange County with her family, only about 50 miles from Los Angeles. Nikki was described by those around her as being shy, but also free-spirited and lively around those who knew her well. Photography was a big hobby of hers, and she often worked with special needs children. But we aren't really only talking about Nikki today. We're going to be talking about the entire Castoris family and their living hell, which would go on to continue for almost 20 years. This took place on Halloween in the year 2006 and seemed to be just as any other normal day would be for the family. They ate some lunch together and got into a little bit of a family argument. Nikki had been caught smoking, something her father was staunchly opposed to, and they debated on taking her car away as a punishment. The argument seemingly wasn't too big of a deal. Shortly after, Nikki gave a wink and said goodbye to her father as he headed off to work, telling him she loved him. It seemed that the argument had already been forgotten. However, this particular squabble wasn't going to end so easily. Nikki proceeded to sneak out of the house shortly after. Given that her car was taken away, she decided to engage in some good old teenage rebellion and take a ride in one of her father's luxury vehicles, a Porsche 911 Carrera. Not only had Nikki never driven this car before, but she was strictly forbidden from doing so, likely making this outing all the more tempting. Completely out of character, according to her parents, Nikki stole the keys to her father's car, something she had never done before. She went into the garage, hopped into the car, and started pulling out. Her mother saw her pulling out of the driveway and immediately phoned her husband, telling him that their daughter had made off with one of his most prized possessions. However, more than anything, her mother was worried for her, as Nikki had peeled out onto the road at a concerningly high speed. Nikki's father was in his car heading to work when he quickly changed course and headed off in the direction that Nikki was seen speeding towards. While driving, he went ahead and called the police and informed them of what was going on. While he searched for his daughter, the 911 dispatcher put him on hold for several minutes. When the dispatcher finally returned, Christos was given horrific, devastating news, something that he wasn't even considering to be a possibility. Nikki had gotten quite far away from their home. She wound up hopping onto a nearby highway and ended up on a toll road on Highway 241 in Lake Forest. It was about 1.45 p.m. at this point. Wanting to make the most of the outing and experience this fancy car to its fullest, she started going at speeds of well over 100 miles per hour, or 160 kilometers per hour, in a car that she had no more than a few minutes of experience driving. Nikki, wanting to gain more speed, tried to pass a Honda Civic in front of her, but she ended up clipping the side of the vehicle. She completely lost control of the Porsche, and her parents' worst fear came true. She crashed headfirst into a concrete toll booth along the side of the highway, going at a speed of well over 100 miles per hour. This crash was absolutely horrific. Anyone who took even one look at the state of the car would know that this crash was completely unsurvivable. The car had wrapped itself around the concrete corner, becoming nothing but a mangled mess of metal, not even resembling a vehicle anymore. Nikki's state was even worse. She had died instantly upon impact. One look at her would make that undeniable. To put it simply, her head was no longer attached to her body. What was left of her no longer resembled her in the slightest. She was in such a state that, if not for her hair, most people looking wouldn't have even known she was a human being. The California Highway Patrol arrived at the crash site almost immediately, seeing the mangled jumble of steel and massive pool of blood underneath. They knew that what they were going to see would prove to be gruesome, but even the seasoned officers were shocked and horrified at what they came to see. Christos arrived at the scene shortly after himself. Seeing the wreckage, he knew that the outlook wasn't going to be good to say the least, but he still held out hope. He shouted at the officers, asking, did she get hurt, but not getting any answers in return. 
Officers kept him behind the police tape, not allowing him to proceed any further. The officers absolutely would not let Christos see the body. Even afterwards, the family was prevented from identifying her, being told, she's unidentifiable, you can't see her body. At first, given how out of character this was for Nikki and how erratic her driving was, people wondered if she had been on some sort of substance at the time of her driving. A toxicology report showed that she had not been drinking, but she did have trace amounts of cocaine left in her system. It wasn't immediately clear if that small of an amount would have impeded her driving in any way that day. After the accident, two California Highway Patrol officers, Aaron Reich and Thomas O'Donnell, were given access to the crime scene photos in order to help with conducting a forensic examination. Unfortunately, these two officers wouldn't keep the spectacle to themselves. Maybe due to the sheer horrific nature of the images, or maybe as some sort of gruesome joke, they sent the photos to their colleagues. The pictures then went on to spread rapidly and eventually made their way out of the hands of the highway patrol. The two officers made a few different claims as to why they spread the images around. Aaron Reich said that he only sent the photo to his own email account for storage. Thomas O'Donnell admitted that he had sent the pictures to four other people. They then alleged that they had emailed these photos out in order to remind their friends and families of the dangers of reckless driving. Most people believe, however, that they were mainly using the pictures to shock their friends as some sort of sick joke. Despite it being illegal to upload these sorts of classified crime scene photos, the photos quickly spread like wildfire. Before too long, they were even making their way onto social media. Within days, the pictures had already started making the rounds on various gore sites, shock sites, and unbelievably even porn sites. Nikki Castora soon became famous online, being referred to by the moniker that she's still known by today, Porsche Girl. If the entire ordeal had ended here, that would have been one thing. The internet, though, is full of monsters, and those monsters were bound to be drawn to this sort of thing. Some truly heinous individuals, after getting their hands on the photos, found out Nikki's identity. One of these trolls made a MySpace page for Nikki, pretending to be a memorial page for her, using photos of the accident in the account's photo gallery. Anyone that came to view the memorial page and look through the old photos of her would come across the gruesome photos of the accident. Nikki's own family came across these horrific photos, seeing what was left of their daughter and sister for the first time. Again, if everything ended here, it would have been horrific enough, but no, these monsters weren't going to quit this easily. If your faith in humanity was already low before, then brace yourself for this. They started using the pictures to directly bully and terrorize Nikki's family. They dug up the email addresses of her parents and started sending the pictures to them directly, sometimes even pretending to be Nikki herself, saying things like, Hey daddy, I'm still alive. The Castoris family were, to say the least, experiencing severe emotional trauma due to the despicable treatment they were facing online. Eventually, the family had to cut themselves off from the internet completely. They came to that decision when even Nikki's own underage sister happened to come across the photographs. Fearing the effect that this might have on her, they were left no choice but to cut themselves off from the internet and to the entire world to an extent. They began to live a life of very limited communication. They even started homeschooling their youngest daughter and did all they could to shelter her from the living hell they were experiencing. The Castoris family needed to do something about the photos, but they feared that any statements they made would only reinvigorate the trolls, give the case more publicity, and increase the sharing of the photos even more. The pictures, though, clearly weren't going anywhere. Despite attempting to remove them from the internet, they were and still are available with a simple Google search. The California Highway Patrol did send a number of cease and desist orders to various websites in an attempt to get the pictures removed from the internet. But anyone who has been on the internet in their entire life knows that it isn't that simple. The Castoris family hired a private organization in an attempt to remove the pictures as well, but to little success. The organization estimated that they must have contacted at least 2,500 websites in an attempt to persuade them into removing the photos. However, they acknowledged from the very beginning that completely eradicating the photos was utterly impossible. Ironically, the attempt to remove the pictures only drew more attention to them, causing people to trade them even more than before. After two years of torture, harassment, and seclusion, with little to no sign of it ever letting up, the family decided it was time to take action. 
Given that the California Highway Patrol did initially send the photos out, they were rightfully taking most of the blame for this entire ordeal. The Castoris family filed a complaint with the police, which said, There is no question that a funeral home would be liable for negligence if it took photographs of the deceased and then disseminated the photos without authorization from the surviving family members. Leslie, Nikki's mother, spoke out as well, saying, Family members have a personal stake in honoring and mourning their dead, and we object to unwarranted public exploitation. This intrusion upon our grief has disgraced the rights and respect we sought and continue to seek on behalf of our beloved daughter, Nikki. The family feared that the public might turn on them if they filed a lawsuit against the police, but after some deliberation, they decided to proceed, feeling that it was only right. Christos, after hiring a lawyer, said, all we ever wanted from day one was to have the CHP help us in getting these pictures removed from websites, but that didn't happen. It was only when someone recommended we hire a lawyer that we eventually filed the lawsuit. But before the family were able to file a lawsuit, they would first have to make a complaint against the state. That claim demanded monetary compensation in exchange for the torture that they had experienced. That figure came out to about $20 million. Asking for such a high amount of money made the public wonder if, perhaps, the family was only looking for a paycheck. Christos, though, was deeply offended by those concerns, saying, it's really disturbing. The CHP needs to be held accountable for this. Case law needs to be established to ensure that this doesn't happen to another family. After a little while, the judge, Stephen L. Perk, actually dismissed the case the family had against the Highway Patrol in March of 2008. This was because the two officers who leaked the photos, Reich and O'Donnell, were removed as defendants, with the judge saying that the two weren't responsible for protecting the privacy of the Castor's family. The judge added that, although the officer's conduct was, in his own words, utterly reprehensible, there wasn't a law they could be punished for. After two more years, in February of 2010, the California Court of Appeal reversed the original judge's decision, instead ruling that the Castoras family did indeed have the right to sue the two officers for both negligence and intentional infliction of emotional distress. The case went on for several years, not concluding until 2012. This was when it was finally decided that the California Highway Patrol was going to have to pay $2.37 million to the family in compensation. After an internal investigation within the Highway Patrol, the CHP issued a formal apology to the Castor's family, promising to take more action in the future in order to prevent an incident like this from ever happening again. One of the two officers who leaked the photos, Aaron Reich, argued that he was allowed to distribute the photos because the act fell under the First Amendment, freedom of speech. The court, however, disagreed. He then claimed that he sent the pictures as an anti-drunk driving message, but the court pointed out that Nikki had no alcohol in her system at the time of her death. The appeal court called the action of the two officers vulgar and morally deficient. The family was able to sue the two for invasion of privacy on behalf of Nikki, an act that sent a new legal precedent in California and has been used in other cases ever since. It seemed that this case could not end with anything better than a bittersweet ending. The family did succeed in suing the police and managed to establish legal precedent that would hopefully keep this from happening to another family in the future. But the emotional trauma isn't going to just disappear overnight and neither will the pictures of Nikki that are still out there on the internet for all to see. The family, in the end, were doomed to accept that their life was never going to go back to normal and that this would be the new norm from here on out. Things with the family went relatively quiet. That was until 2020. In 2020, the same sort of incident would go on to happen with another family, a very famous family. In January of that year, basketball player Kobe Bryant was part of a helicopter crash that ended both his life and the life of his 13-year-old daughter, along with several others who were on board. Similarly to the Castoris case, the L.A. Sheriff's Department leaked photos of the accident, showing the final state of Kobe Bryant and his daughter. With Southern California law enforcement seemingly learning nothing, they shared the pictures among themselves as they, quote, laughed and gawked at the spectacle. Given how famous this family was, these photos were even more likely to circulate online, and they did. In 2021, Nikki Castor's parents shared words of empathy for Vanessa Bryant, Kobe Bryant's wife, as she experienced something very similar to what they had experienced themselves. Christos pointed out that other countries have laws preventing the sharing of these sorts of photos and questioned why the U.S. didn't have something similar. After a few years of legal battles herself, in March of 2023, Vanessa Bryant reached a settlement agreement with Los Angeles County, getting about $2.85 million in compensation for her and her children. 
Two other families who lost their loved ones in the helicopter crash filed their own lawsuits as well. When it comes to the current state of the Castor's family, all of them still remain in counseling to this day, over 15 years after Nikki passed away. Nikki's youngest sisters will go online from time to time, but they are still sent the pictures of their sister every once in a while. Leslie and Christo still speak publicly about the incident every now and then, but they're working towards putting the case behind them and focusing more on the positive memories of their daughter. Leslie said, I don't know how to put in words how I feel. It's not even grief anymore, I just can't describe it. Leslie, being a writer herself, published a memoir, Forever Exposed, that describes the whole ordeal in detail. The family continues to speak publicly about their experience with online harassment, the problems with the police, and the dangers of reckless driving to this day. Once again, thank you for watching this video. This is definitely one of the darkest topics that I've covered in a while. It might be a story that you've heard before, but given the recent stuff with Kobe Bryant's family, I thought it was once again made relevant. If you found the topic interesting, please give it a like. It helps me out in the algorithm, which I got eh, a little bit screwed over in recently. If you find content like this interesting, go ahead and subscribe if you feel like it. Follow me on social media if you want to as well. If you want to support the channel even further, I do have a Patreon, which I always keep linked down in the description below. And speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We've got Anna B, Sunrider, Gabrielle Tansik, Lee aka Crust, Emilia Morales, Mini Tina, Ron Murillo, Travis Billings, Lettuce, Jason Whitehurst, Lord Fool, Jim Dowell, Kimmy Leffel, Melina Lee Williams Haas, Motaz Hawk, Impalato, Stephen Jamie Kramer, Max Swordguy, Rain Noir, Pao Yang, April Diamond, Starfade, Astral, Angie, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Sass Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lex Luther, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Scoochie Maine, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You are all better than I deserve. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.